Hello, everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Alarming news in the world of agriculture this week. Seeds from invasive species arriving in the mail to unsuspecting people in the United States, including here in Oklahoma. OSU's Plant and Soil Sciences Department head, Dr. Jeff Edwards, gets us up to speed. So we've been getting calls and there have been reports in the news about seeds showing up in the mail. Uh, we don't know for sure where these seeds are, are coming from and, and we don't even know what plants the seeds are for, but what we do know is that you should not plant them under any circumstances. And, and here's why. You could introduce a, uh, an invasive species, a new weed to our environment, so we don't want that. Uh, you shouldn't even open the packaging. If they're sealed in plastic packaging, you should not open that because there's potential that there could be insects in there. You could introduce a new insect or you could introduce a new disease uh, that could affect one of our agricultural or horticultural crops in the state. So if you receive seeds in the mail that are, are unsolicited, uh, USDA has asked for the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry to be a collection point for our state. Uh, so you can get in touch with ODAF or you can bring those by your local cooperative extension office and they can serve as a collection point and then get those seeds to uh, ODAF. They are asking that you keep the original packaging uh, because they're, they're going to try and figure out where these seeds are coming from. Don't, don't throw them in the trash. Uh, because they could wind up in a landfill. Uh, you know, if it is a weed seed, weeds are very good at being able to germinate anywhere. Uh, so that could induce, introduce it to the uh, environment. If you have questions, contact your local county extension office. Maybe you've seen it online. There's a really cool lunchtime series that, that, that you guys are doing with uh, that, that involves Oklahoma ranchers. We call it the Ranchers Thursday Lunchtime Series, mm -hmm. and it's a 30 minute to an hour webinar every Thursday at 12:30. Then you can just we can link it to the SunUp website, and they can see what's coming up. And the really neat thing is that we're able to uh, record each one of those videos and then uh, in many cases we also have the slide presentation available there on the on the website as well so they can go look or watch those uh, learn from them at any time uh, dr kevin shinners mm -hmm. university of wisconsin madison mm -hmm. uh, talked about uh, just management tips to minimize deterioration of round bales stored outside and it was just a phenomenal presentation there were a number of factors in there that, that, that Oklahoma producers may do that maybe they should maybe rethink and, and, and get a little more life out of their round bales. Yes, a lot of those practical tips. And I, maybe I could uh, boil them down into, you know, he, he emphasized that you should start off with a good quality dense bale with square shoulders, right. use net wrap, create that thatch on the outside. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing he emphasized, which is obvious I think to everyone is store the bales in a very well drained area mm -hmm. um, and then uh, secondly or thirdly uh, he suggested uh, that you maintain sunlight uh, to the bales so that once they do get wet they dry out rapidly mm -hmm. and the last thing he emphasized was airflow which is something we probably don't think about a lot but uh, you know don't stack them next to a building uh, next to a bunch of trees or brush uh, and control the vegetation. When it comes to the last one that you said, controlling vegetation, it does take a little bit of distance between the bales to do that. What, what is a good distance between the bales to, to promote that airflow, but then also vegetation? So he, he suggested that a minimum of three feet between bales, so three, four, five feet, but really at the end of the day, you probably want to, if you have the space, to store them wide enough to get whether you're gonna use the, the zero turn mower to go down through them, but control the vegetation, right? right. So if, if they need to be wide enough to get the bush hog down through, then stack them that wide, but, but stack them wide enough to get equipment through there, whether it's a sprayer or a mower, so that you can control the vegetation. 
Uh, he suggested stacking the bales north to south, mm -hmm. not east to west, and butt them up against each other like most people do. Uh, but by doing that and that three to four feet minimum space, the sun rises in the east, it sets in the west all afternoon. It has, especially in the afternoon, a good opportunity to dry those bales out if they're stacked north to south, but not as much if they're stacked east to west. Are there advantages or none at all to, to doubling up, you know, double stacking the hay bales? He strongly recommended do not. Right. And he, he, the point was that uh, that's a collector of moisture. The bottom bales are going to collect moisture. Uh, so stacking works very well if you're gonna use a tarp or if they're gonna be stacked inside. If they're gonna be stacked outside in the open, do not stack bales. Uh, stack them, butt them up tightly, north to south, southern facing slope, and leave three to four feet in between. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Dave Lawman. And we'll have a link to those websites, including the presentation he was talking about, on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. As we go into those uh, dog days of summer here in August, it's usually a pretty hot, dry time of the year. And we know that forage quality is beginning to decline, especially in our summer pastures, natives, and the Bermuda grass pastures. That becomes an issue if we're growing some uh, fall-born replacement heifers where we're trying to get enough gain on them to have them big enough to breed uh, in the breeding season in November, early December, or even with uh, yearling stalker cattle that we're running out here on summer pasture. We know from research done at Oklahoma State University a number of years ago that a small amount of a protein supplement, uh, they use the term the Oklahoma Gold Program, that small amount, meaning about only one pound per head per day of a high protein supplement, 38 to 40 percent crude protein, really provided a rather substantial increase in average daily gain in the tune of three to four tenths a pound average daily gain increase compared to cattle that did not receive any kind of supplement at all. Well, there's a reason why that works, and we call it a positive associative effect. And what we're talking about here is what that little bit of protein does for especially the microbes in the rumen of these cattle. It has an effect on their ability to digest forage and to do it more quickly. If you look at this particular table, you'll see some of the research that was done years ago where they gave some heifers a really, really pretty low quality forage. It was less than 5% crude protein. And without any kind of supplementation at all, those cattle could only consume about 1.7% of their body weight. But if they got one and three quarters pounds of a high protein supplement, they could consume 2.15% of their body weight and that represented about a 27% increase in uh, just a voluntary intake of that low quality forage just by the presence of that uh, high protein supplement. The reason that that happened is if you look at the graph again, you'll see that there's a tremendous difference in how long it took those cattle to digest that forage. Without the supplement, about 75 hours for that roughage to be completely digested, turned over in the rumen. If they got the protein and those bugs got the protein, then the turnover time or the retention time of that low quality forage was cut down by 32% or only about 56 hours. Therefore, what's going on is these cattle get hungry again more quickly and they consume more of the forage uh, on a voluntary basis. Keep this concept in mind, and I think it'll really help you. If you'd like to learn more about uh, late summer supplementation uh, on these warm season grasses with a high protein supplement, I urge you to go to the SUNUP website. We'll put a link there that'll help you get a better understanding of what's going on uh, in this uh, late summer period with that high protein supplementation. And we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. 
We're joined now by Dr. Rosalind Biggs, our extension beef cattle specialist, to talk about body condition. And Rosalind, let's start off by talking about our spring calvers and some of the considerations to keep in mind. Right. Well, you know, our spring calvers obviously have calves at side, hopefully, uh, this time of year. And as we're looking at those pasture conditions, they traditionally, as we get into late June, July, will will decrease in quality. So we need to really be evaluating those females to make sure that they're maintaining their condition and perhaps uh, supplement as needed. And also take a look at those, uh, those calves at side and evaluate them uh, with, with their mothers to make sure that uh, those females are maintaining that condition. We may in some cases either want to supplement or we may want to look at early weaning depending upon our pasture conditions and our other resources for supplementation to make sure that we're choosing economically and keeping those females in good condition so they can come right back around next spring and, and be productive for us. How do I make that call? How do I know what the, what the condition is and, and, and what the criteria is for supplements or additional measures? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the, the initial thing is to Take a, take a hard look at those females and evaluate their body condition scores. You know, as we talk about uh, at calving, it's the same for spring calvers and fall calvers. We're looking for those first calf heifers to calve in a body condition score of six, and we want those mature cows at least in a body condition five, uh, five to six, so that they can um, have good calvings have good colostrum and and get um, get those calves on the ground and, and in good shape. But you know, in this in this last run, that last trimester of pregnancy, are the biggest demands for for fetal growth, and we want to make sure that we're maintaining those cows, especially as we mentioned that pasture conditions may be may be declining in certain areas, and so. We want to evaluate our supplementation of those females to keep them again in that body condition that's going to be appropriate. We don't want them. We don't want them thin. We certainly don't want them too heavy either. And again, putting them those mature cows right at that five to six, and those first calf heifers right at that body condition score of six. You and the team have a lot of resources available for those who want to learn more. Absolutely. Uh, you know, our website, beef.okstate.edu, has a wealth of resources uh, from nutrition to health, really everything uh, that the producer might want to take a look at. I encourage folks to take a look at that. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dr. Right. Biggs. Thank you. And for a link to that website, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. China always seems to be in the news lately. So Kim, what's going on? Well, if you look at China, you got to look at their 1.4 plus billion people and 1.4 times any number is a big number. So China's, China's big. If you look at when it comes to crops on the wheat, China produces 17.7% of the world's wheat crop and they use 17.4. So they're pretty much uh, self-sufficient in wheat production. In corn, they, use, they produce 22% of the world's corn crop and they use 24 of it. So they're, go they're gonna have to import corn. Soybeans, China produces 5% of the world's soybean crop. 61% of the uh, imports are by China. You look at cotton, China produces 23% of the cotton and uses 32%. So China is a big user, a big importer of most agriculture commodities. Sticking with corn in there, China's been selling corn out of the reserve, of the government reserves. So what, in, what impact is that gonna have here in the U.S.? Well, that's gonna have some impact on the U.S. Uh, you go back uh, a few weeks, uh, China bought U.S. corn for uh, imports. Uh, we had about a 25 cent increase in prices from that. Uh, we've lost 25 cents over the last week or so. Uh, but also over that same period, we, around the United States and around the world, we got rain on the, uh, the corn crops. Uh, the, they've increased the corn estimate for production. And I think we've had that 25 cent decline is mostly because of weather and increased production expectations. So I think a little bit of impact on prices, but not much. So with the, the economy the way that it is right now, the U.S. dollar has been declining a little bit, but is there going to be a positive impact when it comes to, the, to our U.S. crops? I think for agriculture, it's a positive uh, aspect because the, you go back to March, the, the uh, dollar index was about uh, 104. It's down to around 93, a little above that right now. That's about a 10% decline in that index. That means that corn, wheat, 
soybeans are 10% cheaper out on the world market. It makes us more competitive. So from an agriculture standpoint, I think it's positive. It's August 1st, so we're heading toward the end of the summer. What advice do you have for farmers? I think farmers have got to realize that uh, the pr farmers around the world are going to get more competitive. You've got Russia, lower wheat prices because they increased their uh, wheat production estimate. You look at, at Brazil, uh, they're bringing in more acres for, for soybeans. And you look at Ukraine, Argentina, Brazil, they're already uh, exporting about 58% of the world's soybean exports. exports. So you've got uh, more competition from around the world. Our producers should expect more competition. We've got to keep our costs low and our quality high. All righty, Kim. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. There's been a lot of interest as far as potassium goes from producers across the Southern Great Plains. And Brian, you got into a conversation on Twitter with some producers. Yep. Tell, tell me about what their concerns were about potassium. So it actually started off with the University of Arkansas Soil Fertility Specialist, uh, Dr. Trent Roberts, posting a picture of some soybean that he had seen in Northwest Arkansas with potassium deficiencies, asking, had, had you seen this? Do you know what this is? Kind of a question. And the conversation started rolling uh, showing our, our producers in Northeast Oklahoma seeing deficiencies. I've personally seen a significant amount of deficiencies across North Central Oklahoma. And it all comes down to we have a yellowing of the lower to mid canopy on our soybean crop and the cotton crop as we go through. Now with potassium, the reason for that has been what we expect to be twofold this year. One is just low soil test potassium. Uh, you would expect to see potassium deficiencies where you have low soil test K and you haven't fertilized. But also, a lot of these symptoms are coming with the double crop, maybe a little bit later planted, soybeans, some of the cotton, or we have root restrictions. So here's a good example. We have this big cotton plant right here. We're looking at a very tall cotton plant, and you saw I yanked it out of the ground with very little effort. Yeah. It is wet, we have good soil moisture, but because of the ground we're in right now, we have very limited rooting structure. And so because of that, you're starting to see deficiencies of potassium. So you get leaves like this, where you have chlorosis and yellowing. We have intravenous chlorosis is turning yellow on this, and you also see this on the soybeans, and it's lower leaves. It's attributed, in this case, we have plenty of potassium in our soil but the roots are small and the only way these plants cotton and soybean or some plants can take up potassium is hitting it with their roots they've got to come in contact with it and both cotton and soybean are very heavy k users it takes a lot of potassium to fill the bowls and fill the pods say say a producer is out scouting their crop and they're and, and, and they're and they're not seeing the threshold that maybe they they feel comfortable making an application. What's the potential yield loss if they don't make that application? The potential yield loss is a little bit of environmental dependent. Uh, it's harder to say if we have a soil test value and a good root, we can tell you exactly how much is going to be lost because we have a sufficiency level for that. Right. When it comes to limited rooting being the problem that the plant can't access the potassium, right. now it's harder to estimate because you don't know the extent that root can reach out and get to new potassium. In some cases, I've seen some soybean fields in the last couple of years that we easily lose 40 to 50 percent of, of the yield potential. Right. But in others where it's just a slight yellowing, slight deficiency, the crop can grow out, the roots start exploring better, the soil moisture, this rain that we just had will help their roots explore and get to a little bit more of that potassium. So if you just have slightly yellowing, maybe not worry about it, but if you have extreme deficiencies, a, a deep yellowing and necrosis or dying of tissue, you need to be thinking about what are your options and do you think you can get on some potassium before rain. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian Arnell. And for more information and help with this, visit your local county extension office or visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Welcome to the weekly Mesonet weather report. I'm Wes Lee. Rains continued for many areas of the state this week. In a few locations, such as Oklahoma City and Yukon, intensity was so great that localized flooding occurred. As of Wednesday afternoon, the rainfall had improved soil moisture over a large part of Oklahoma. 
This map of the 4-inch fractional water index shows that there are now more green wet areas in the state as compared to the dry brown areas. Additional rainfall could improve this situation even more by the end of the week. Along with the rains this week came some great relief from high temperatures. This chart is the statewide high temperatures for the month through the middle of the week. The blue fill area is the long-term average and the dark line is the July average high temperatures. You can see that the temperatures were much below normal towards the end of the month. By the way, the statewide average hottest day of the year usually occurs on August 5th at 95.4 degrees. Cool weather is likely to continue into the start of August as seen by this forecast map for very comfortable highs on Saturday. For the upcoming week, the National Weather Service is predicting a cooler than normal temperature outlook as indicated by all of the blue on this map over Oklahoma. Gary is up next with some great rainfall totals for the month. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well we continue with our amazing comeback in July rainfall. It was certainly looking a little bit scary there as we got through June and we had drought increasing across much of the western half of the state, even up into northeastern Oklahoma. Well, the good July rains have stopped that drought, and it looks like we're on the uh, mend a little bit. So a much nicer picture than what we've seen over the last couple of months. Uh, we do still have uh, uh, moderate to extreme drought across parts of west central Oklahoma, up into north, northwestern Oklahoma, and then also out in the far western panhandle and a little bit of moderate drought over in uh, north central and northeast Oklahoma. But for the most part, we're just dealing with no drought at all, maybe some abnormally dry conditions uh, over much of the state. And that north central down through central parts of the state picture looks much better than what it was earlier. And this July rainfall, as we see from the mezzanine, is absolutely wonderful. And in some cases, it did cause flooding. Uh, in Oklahoma, we have to deal with the good uh, that comes with the bad. Um, but we do see across north central down in central Oklahoma a large area of 8 to 9 to even more than 10 inches uh, above 11 inches of rainfall even um, across that area. So that's a drought killer there. So that's wonderful. The departure from normal for July thus far, well, more than 6 to 8 inches of rainfall uh, above normal up in north central Oklahoma, a larger area 3 to 5 inches above normal up to 6 inches. And also the same thing out in the central panhandle, uh, central panhandle, uh, one to, to four and a half inches above normal. And then we see other areas across the state, um, northeast Oklahoma, three to five inches above normal. We still see those areas of deficits, however, across parts of south central into southeast Oklahoma and down in far southwestern Oklahoma. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We're about a month away before producers are going to start seeding alfalfa. So Alex, what do producers need to think about before they start doing that? I would say that if they didn't do yet, go ahead and select an appropriate field to seed their alfalfa. Alfalfa seed is very expensive. There are lots of money involved on herbicide, on prepping the soil, on fertilization. So I believe that for invest all those resources and energy, better that you select the right field so you can be successful. You know, when it comes to the right field, do producers need to think about, uh, you know, the amount of rain that it's going to get? Like, you have some alfalfa planted out here and we just got a lot of rain right. um, and you see a lot of standing water. Does that play a role? Yes. In alfalfa, that really plays a big role. That's why our alfalfa starts over there because we don't have any water logging, ponding over there as we have here. That is the worst situation for an alfalfa field. First thing that you need to think on an alfalfa field is a deep soil, well drained, that is leveled and we have slopes, ideally talking, less than 2%. Because those water pondings that you, you are seeing here, the, al the alfalfa roots stay in that condition, they will really die asphyxiated. Also, can have alfalfa scalding, and diseases such as root rot, that's a very concern here in Oklahoma when you talk about alfalfa. If you had alfalfa in a field, or you have alfalfa in a field right now, and your stand is thin, and you are planning on terminating that alfalfa field, and right after see the new alfalfa, I would say that might be a no-go. 
the old alfalfa stand produced some substances that is toxic to the new alfalfa seedlings. That's what you call autotoxicity. So when you talk about uh, you are selecting a field and pay attention and go back in time and think in a year and a half back in time, I had alfalfa any time in that field. If the answer is yes, I highly recommend that they go and read the fact sheet of alfalfa autotoxicity. In that fact sheet, there is a nice table that can help the producer uh, really figure out how long he needs to wait uh, exactly to put a new alfalfa stand there. All right, thanks, Alex. Right. Dr. Alex Arcatelli, Board System Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you would like a link to that lunchtime series, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup. <laughs>